Sonnet 18 by William Shakespeare Shall I compare thee to a summer's day? We all know that William Shakespeare is from Great Britain and he is a well-known playwright, artist, dramatist, and a poet. He was born in 1564 and died uh, in 1616 on the same date when he was born, according to records. William Shakespeare was an English poet, a playwright, and an actor widely regarded as the greatest writer in the English language and as the world's greatest dramatist. He is often called England's national poet and the bard of Avon. Why Avon? Because he is from or he came from Stratford upon Avon, a place in England. The English sonnets were named after him, uh, the Shakespearean sonnets, aside of course of being coined uh, Elizabethan sonnets. 154 Shakespearean sonnets were first published altogether in a quarto in 1609. However, there are six additional sonnets that Shakespeare wrote and included in the plays Romeo and Juliet, Henry V, and Love's Labors Lost. There is also a partial sonnet found in the play Edward III. Shakespeare's sonnets are a continuation of the sonnet tradition through the Renaissance from Petrarch, introduced in 16th century England by Thomas Wyatt, and was given its rhyming meter and division into quatrains by Henry Howard. Shakespeare introduces a young man in his sonnets. He also introduces the dark lady who is no goddess unlike the traditional sonnets back in the 13th century in Italy. Shakespeare explores themes which also open new terrain for the sonnet form. The sonnets cover such themes as the passage of time, love, infidelity, jealousy, beauty, and mortality. The first 126 are addressed to a young man. The last 28 are either addressed to or referred to a woman. The first 17 poems, traditionally called the procreation sonnets, are addressed to the young man urging him to marry and have children in order to immortalize his beauty by passing it to the next generation. Other sonnets express the speaker's love for the young man, brood upon loneliness, death and the transience of life seem to criticize the young man for preferring a rival poet, express ambiguous feelings for the speaker's mistress, and pun on the poet's name. The final two sonnets are allegorical treatments of Greek epigrams referring to the little love god Cupid. What sonnet 18 is all about? Now we shall be dealing with sonnet 18, one of the greatest sonnets written by William Shakespeare. In the sonnet, the speaker asks whether he could or he should compare the young man to a summer's day but notes that the young man has qualities that surpass a summer's day, qualities subject to change and will eventually diminish. The speaker then states that the young man will live forever in the lines of the poem as long as it can be read. There is an irony, though, being expressed in this sonnet. It is not the actual young man who will be eternalized, but the description of him contained in the poem. And the poem contains scant or no description of the young man, but instead contains vivid and lasting descriptions of a summer day, which the young man is supposed to outlive. Now here we have the sonnet 18, line by line, written by William Shakespeare. Sonnet 18, as I have mentioned, is one of the best known of the 154 sonnets written by the English playwright and poet William Shakespeare. In the first four lines, or quatrain one, uh, we have the following lines, and we will notice the structure written later, or made or followed, in this sonnet and it also applies to all the other sonnets written by Shakespeare. Now let's read on. Shall I compare thee to a summer's day? 
thou art more lovely and more temperate. Rough winds do shake the darling buds of May, and summer's least has all too short a date. In Quatrain 2, we read four more lines. Sometime too hot the eye of heaven shines, and often is his gold complexion dimmed, and every fair from fair sometime declines, by chance or nature's changing course untrimmed. This is the, the last quatrain, or the third quatrain, lines 9, 10, 11, and 12. And you will see we will start with the word but, which is where the turn of events will um, will start, will begin. The first two quatrains present the uh, case, the, the scenario, a question, like, shall I compare it to a summer's day? And our, uh, the, the, the solution leading to, the lines leading to the solution will start to be revealed, unfolded from quatrain three. And the solution actually will be found in the last two lines, which is called the rhyming couplet. So quatrain three reads, But thy eternal summer shall not fade, nor lose possession of that fair thou owes, nor shall death brag the wonders in his shade, when in eternal lines to time thou grows. And this is the couplet, the 13th and 14th lines. And in here we find the solution to the question brought about or presented in the sonnet. So long as man can breathe or eyes can see, so long lives this and this gives life to thee. Okay, so we have here uh, for the structure, we should be guided by the following. Shakespeare sonnets observe the stylistic form of the English sonnet, the rhyme scheme, the 14 lines, and the meter. We already have um, uh, uh, referred to or discussed the 14 lines in sonnet 18. Three quatrains, four lines for its quatrain, and after the three quatrains or the 12 lines, we have the 13 and 14 lines which is called the rhyming couplet and which contains the solution to the um, case presented in the sonnet. Now here we shall deal with the structure uh, uh, closer, uh, more closely. Sonnet 18 is a typical English or Shakespearean sonnet having 14 lines of iambic pentameter. Now why iambic pentameter? Because an iambus consists of one unstressed syllable and one stressed syllable. Okay, we'll find it here. Okay, here. This is the, the excess represent the unstressed syllables and the, this um, lines, slant lines uh, represent the stressed sim syllables. So when we read this line, the first line of the rhyming couplet, the 13th line, so long as man can breathe or eyes can see. So you see, we have this like melodious lines written in sonnets. And we, let's count how many pairs of iambos, or we have here uh, pairs of unstressed and stressed syllables. We have one, two, three, four, and five. That's why we have here um, one of the uh, structure points of a sonnets, a Shakespearean sonnets, is it being or written in iambic pentameter. Penta means five. So there are five pairs of stressed and unstressed syllables. And its, it's um, pair is called iambic or an iambus because the stressed syllable is preceded by an unstressed syllable. So let's read it once again. So long as man can breathe, the eyes can see. 
Okay, let's uh, read on. Three quatrains followed by a couplet, which we have studied earlier. It also has the characteristic rhyme scheme A, B, A, B, C, D, C, D, E, F, E, F, G, G. Okay, so this represent, all these letters represent the last word of each line. So we call them end rhymes. The first line, okay, let's try to go back to uh, the sonnet. This is the first line at the end it ends uh, with the word day, isn't it? Okay, so since we, this line ends with the word day, day is uh, the first rhyme that should be considered. So we have, let's label it capital letter A. The third line is rough winds do shake the darling buds of May. Day rhymes with May. So they have the same rhyming. So let's label May. Okay, label it with the letter A. Day and May. The second line though doesn't rhyme the end rhyme doesn't go with the first and the third let's read on though art more lovely and more temperate so since it has a different okay it has a different rhyme scheme let us try to label it with another um, letter Temperate doesn't rhyme with day or may, so let's label it with letter B because temperate, okay, this produces the sound pret, okay. Now B, temperate, and summer sleeves had all to short a date, rate and date they rhyme, so they can be of the same um, letter with the same letter represented. Okay, the next line ends with the word shines that goes and rhymes with shines declines. So this is another rhyming pair, a uh, rhyme, okay, rhyming line or end rhyme. So we label them with another letter B, okay. So let's try to go and check the sixth line which is dimmed. And seven and eight lines, we have this as another rhyming um, and, and syllables, dimmed and trimmed. So the rhyming scheme goes A, B, A, B, C, D, C, D. Okay, so it also goes like, so we remember that this is the first quatrain, and this is the second quatrain, and they contain the um, um they contain the question in the sonnet okay why the sonnet was written and so goes on with the end rhyme for the third quatrain here which is e the fade rhymes with um shade right okay Fade rhymes with shade, so we can now um, have, uh, let's say, um, another letter for fade, which is, let's see, uh, here, E. Let's label this with E. Okay. Here is E. And... Fade rhymes with shade. Let's go. And this is also and rhyme E. So we should, uh, we expect to have an EFEF -E here. Let's see if we can achieve that, which is like here. For O's and gross, we have the another pair, which is um, labeled F. And the last Two lines, the rhyming couplet, which ends with says uh, end syllables of C and D, we label them 
like um, G because they uh, rhyme together okay so here we go uh, we're losing it yes so now we have here the end rhymes G okay this is our third quatrain and this is our so-called couplet in some sonnets in especially in uh, traditional uh, uh, British English we they have uh, indented the the rhyming couplet indented so that means these two lines here in some traditional writings are written like indented that means moved like an inch away from the um, the margin left hand margin okay so we will go to the interpretation or meaning of the poem this is a very interesting um, sonnet it became famous because of its um, yeah interpretation okay but before that let us go to the vocabulary words some some meanings like just to unlock difficulties and here we have the notes written we have complexion in line six can we we can have two meanings for this okay for these two meanings we have First, the outward appearance of the face as compared with the sun or the eye of heaven in the previous line or the older sense of the word in relation to the four humors. The, in Shakespeare's time, complexion carried both outward and inward meanings as did the word template, temperate. Externally, a weather condition. Internally, a balance of humors. The second meaning of complexion, complexion would communicate that the beloved's inner cheerful and temperate uh, disposition is constant, unlike the sun, which may be blotted out on a cloudy day. Okay, so the first meaning is more obvious, a negative change in its outward appearance we have another word here use and trimmed which has two meanings first is the sense of loss of decoration and frills and the second second in the sense of untrimmed sails on the ship in the first interpretation the poem leads reads the beautiful things naturally lose their fanciness over time in the second it reads the nature is a ship with sails not adjusted to wind changes in order to correct course this, in combination with the words nature's changing course, creates an oxymoron, a figure of speech, the unchanging chains of nature, or the fact that the only thing that does not change is change. That's beautiful. This line in the poem creates a shift from the mutability of the first eight lines into the eternity of the last six lines. Both chains and eternity are then acknowledged and challenged by the final line. So we have here... Um, this should be uh, referring to the uh, old English words like O, O West, O's, Grossed, Gross. Okay, and the word Lees here, we have the word fair can be a span on fair or the fair required by nature for life's journey. And summer, for example, is said to have a lease with all too short a date. This monetary theme is common in many of Shakespeare's sonnets as it was an everyday theme in his budding capitalistic society. Now we shall go back to the quatrain so we can get to the interpretation of each line. Okay, so let us go to the uh, meaning line by line as interpreted by some scholars and as how I personally interpret or paraphrase this sonnet written by William Shakespeare. Now here the speaker um, is uh, like having a proposition. Shall I compare thee to a summer's day? So when you are a poet, you go like, you speak in uh, melodiously, okay, and you, you'll have this proposition. Should I compare you to a summer's day? This is one person I'm talking to, and it seems like I idolize this person, I admire this person, and the second line goes like continuously, um, um, 
like describe the person being idolized okay shall i compare thee to a summer's day thou art more lovely and more temperate thou art means you you are more lovely and you are more mean you are milder you you can go like um a person who is like subtle you know a person who is like um uh you you have uh, consistency you you go to extremes okay you are energized and on the third line you have the continuity of the description rough winds do shake the darling buds of me even if there's a change in weather even of there's change in season you see the fourth line says the summer sleaze hath all too short a date we only have a short um, period given for the summer season so generally for uh, countries having four seasons winter spring summer or falls we follow this pattern okay so we cannot have because of the climactic change perhaps we may have advanced heat in summer we may experience the heat of summer like two weeks before and like uh, instead of having a uh, instead of having a falls okay um, for three months we'll have it minus two weeks so the summer lease has all too short a date summer is too short i cannot compare your being famous your being beautiful young and bubbly to the summer season i cannot because for me forever you are lovely you are beautiful you when i imagine you you're so full of energy you're so intelligent okay you're so famous uh, as we may say and this is what the first quatrain is all about do i have to compare you to a summer's day summer is only for a short period of time forever for me you exist like just like what you are and how you are okay and then for the second quatrain it's it reads sometime too hot the eye of heaven shines Okay, the eye of heaven refers to the sun. It's up there shining. Okay, although the sun uh, shines um, um, intensely in summer, it is still up there, isn't it? Even if it's springtime or wintertime or, or um, fall. The sun is still up there, only covered with clouds and different level you know as so how we describe our seasons but the sun is still up there and often is his gold complexion dimmed okay because of the change in this season the clouds you know the movement the weather conditions the complexion that used to be so fair in summer becomes dimmed because of the clouds covered that covers the rays of the sun from entering our our um, where we are and and every fair from fair sometimes declines okay so it is a continuity of um how bright and shiny the sun is compared to the life the being the popularity of the person we adore you know the beauty how lovely she or he is and the fourth line goes by chance or nature's changing course untrimmed not changed at all untrimmed not moved at all it's if you admire a person the person will be the same forever in fact in quatrain three let's move on in quatrain three even death it's mentioned there in line um 11 uh, nor shall death brag the wonders in his shade okay let's before we go to line 11 let's go to nine first for line nine but thy eternal summer shall not fade you see this is the turn it seems like when the seasons change 
there is a change in the movement of the clouds and everything, the season, how one feels. But in in quadrain three, um, line nine, we start with the turn of events, turn of belief. Okay, because of the word but. This is the opposition and contradiction. But thy eternal summer shall not fade. It is pointed out here that your brightness, your being lovely, will never fade at all. Line 10, nor lose possession of that fair thou owes. You will never lose your beauty, your loveliness, your brightness, your being energetic. No, not at all. Line 11, nor shall death brag thou wanders in his shade. Not even death can take you away from my mind, from my, you know, from my memories. When in eternal lines to time thou grows. Okay, so when we have your eternal lines, uh, an ending for our timeline, right? If in case one grows old, even aging, no cannot stop. Uh, the speaker from admiring this person he is addressing the sonnet to remember he is admiring a person here the speaker I said he because it is expected that it's written by William Shakespeare right so now here we have the word eternal and um, the word is used here because of course everyone uh, everyone dies, everyone grows old, but this person that I admire, whatever happens, that he admires per se, whatever happens will never change, okay? Still, the person will be alive in his memories, alive, uh, as beautiful, as lovely, as temperate, as energetic, no change at all. You see, let's see why did the uh, why did the speaker say it? Let's try to go to the thirteenth and fourteenth line. The solution to our proposition. Shall I compare it to a summer's day? Well, according to the proposition, the thirteenth and fourteenth lines, you cannot be compared to a summer's day because the summer summer season is just for a time being just one fourth of the year uh, um, it goes like a cycle but it's still there it, it never changes the feeling the desire the admiration is still there just the same and it will be forever like that so let's read on the couplet so long as man can breathe or eyes can see so for as long as men are men people are reading this um, sonnet people are because in this sonnet the the young man being admired by the speaker is like is still living is still alive is still there so as long as you read these lines in your memory you will still picture a human being a person who is as lovely and as temperate as bubbly like summer and let's read on the last line so long lives this this refers to this sonnet and this gives life to the who is which is giving life to the to the person being admired if it's a young man or whatever it's the words in this sonnet isn't it shakespeare is addressing this sonnet to himself because um he idolizes himself he believes in himself he, he he like um he was thinking about his when he grows older you know how will things be so he tried to write a sonnet that will remind people or remind even himself that for as long as people will read his works his sonnets his plays you know his um uh, work his will remember his like whatever uh, uh, literary work he he wrote during his time for as long as 
the people or the succeeding generations will read on they will always remember William Shakespeare and he will always be alive in the thoughts in the memories in the words written in his work of literary works okay so this is how I interpret this um, sonnet and it's a very complex uh, sonnet but uh, it it has it you may associate it with a young man yes but just think of it how can a, a Shakespeare fall in love with a young man so it's like um, narcissistic in its form and because he has written so many plays and tragedies comedies and and also sonnets per se 154 plus 6 and you see and he he, he died not that old and we will always remember him because of how the words he were put together by him so this is sonnet 18 by William Shakespeare and I hope everyone uh, has, gets a hand of the interpretation of sonnet 18 and uh, we can uh, always go back to the beginning from the start of this video and try to read on and try to interpret um, maybe we, maybe you will arrive with a different interpretation just uh, send me a note write down in the comment section so that we will be enlightened we may unfold unveil the mysteries of what what's in the mind of Shakespeare when he wrote his sonnets particularly sonnet 18 we shall be having um, different readings each day in different sonnets so that uh, we may be reminded of uh, the literary world made created by William Shakespeare for um, Great Britain all right and how he contributed that much to the British English literature that's all for now and thank you and I expect to um, see you in our daily readings of our sonnets thank you and stay safe God bless and have a nice day thanks for watching stay safe under God's protection in Jesus name we pray amen